pressures. In fact, we've done quite a few experiments at the flume where we have two debris flows, one that hits a bed with that it trains material and becomes much, much more mobile. Um, so yeah, I think it plays a big role and that's one reason we like to better have better physical models for that entrainment process. Okay, we should move on, but let's uh, let's thank David one more time. Thanks. So our next speaker is Paul Bates from the University of Bristol, and he is going to be talking to us about modeling flood risk in the continental U.S. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you. Uh, and um, I've got two really tough acts to follow. This is going to be a, a challenge, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so I'm going to talk about some recent work we've been doing uh, in Bristol, modeling flood risk across the whole continental U.S. Um, um, so we have, for a number of years at Bristol, been developing a computational model called Risk Flood FP, which uh, simulates shallow water flooding with uh, the 2D shallow water equations. Um, so I'm going to be talking about work I've done with uh, a whole bunch of different colleagues, Neil Quinn, Chris Sampson, Andy Smith, Ollie Wing, and Jeff Neal. Um, and um, this, this work has been reported firstly in a paper in Water Resources Research in September last year, and we've had a paper out in uh, environmental research letters in February this year as well. So the background to this is that um, flooding in the US is, uh, as you know, it's a significant economic and, and uh, 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 well-being hazard. Um, if you have a look at the National Weather Service data, thank you very much. Yes. Um, if you have a look at the National Weather Service data, they provide uh, loss estimates and, and casualty estimates for inland flooding the period 1903 to 2014. If you take the average over that whole kind of century period, it's about 5 billion US dollars a year flood losses on average. Um, and there's around about 100 fatalities every year as well. And there's, there's no significant trend in fatalities over, over that same time. National Flood Insurance Program costs about 190 million US dollars a year, and it's got a significant debt. And recent events like Harvey and Irma have really raised the profile of, of, uh, of flood risk for government, insurers, and public, uh, uh, and scientists as well. So if you take the, the weather service data and you, you fit a, a generalized Pareto distribution through it, um, you get uh, an estimate of what the 1% annual probability US flood loss is. It's about 34 billion US dollars. The high point on this, 2005, that's just the inland flooding component of the Katrina event. So, the 1% annual probability or 0.5% or uh, uh, annual probability is the, the level insurers typically use to, to work out whether they've got enough capital to pay out in the, in the advent of, of a, a really bad year. So these are important numbers. So if we want to learn something more about flooding, it's obvious we're going to need to harness some computer uh, modeling efforts. We don't have observations of extreme flooding everywhere we would like them. The only way we can really get at that and make predictions is to, to harness the power of computer models. And in this discipline over the last 20 years, as we saw in, in David's talk, um, remote sensing of terrain data has really, really revolutionized our ability to do modeling uh, for floods over a lot of different scales. So starting out 20 years ago, we, we started to get the first airborne laser altimeter data. And that completely changed our view of, of how we built flood models. We move from this really uh, data poor science to one where at least for the terrain data was incredibly uh, rich and detailed. So this is a, um, a reach on the River Severn in the UK that I've worked on a fair bit. Um, and you can see this beautiful uh, geomorphology emerging uh, in LiDAR data. We've even in the last kind of five years been able to step that up and start to build global and continental scale models, taking uh, Process, you know, custom process versions of the SRTM terrain data set. That's allowed us to build, this is a, uh, a one in a hundred year flood hazard map for the whole of Africa at 100 meter spatial resolution. Um, so we can do these things at, from beautiful detailed reach scale models uh, right up to uh, continental scale. And just not to be outdone by David's animations, um, this is, um, this is an, uh, actually I think his was better, but uh, um, this is an animation of uh, a 2D flood model simulation of a, an urban area in the UK, which flooded back in 2005. And we built a, a five meter resolution 2D model of the whole um, urban area. So this is building resolving. You actually resolve the flows around the individual building. And it's got three rivers coming in and a, and a main, uh, two small ones and a main uh, channel. 
and you can see the complex progression of the flood wave into a series of flood compartments as, as defenses overtop and, and areas get inundated. And you can see, if you look closely, complex backwater uh, breaching effects. So when we've got the data, we can produce really good models, but when we step up to the global and continental scales, we don't, SRTM is, uh, uh, is the best we've got and it, and it has some limitations. And that's where the US comes in because you guys have really good data over an entire continent. Um, so we can build um, something that's intermediate between the global models and these local uh, detailed models for the US and test our ability to produce continental scale automated model builds at, at whole continental scale. And that's what we've been doing, playing with over the last couple of years, where we've taken our list flood FP model and we've produced a 30 meter list flood model of the, of the whole US. Now, clearly, you, you can't do that basin by basin. You, can't even do it um, with, in anything other than a, a, an automated way. So we've written a framework of, of around about 70,000 lines of MATLAB, Python, and, and R code to automatically build 2D hydraulic models across the whole continental US, and then simulate a number of different return period hazard events. So the data we can use here are, uh, are particularly important. So instead of SRTM, we can replace that with the US National Elevation Dataset. So this is LIDAR, where it's been collected, and the best available, it's a composite source, it's the best available data at any particular location that we've got. Um, that comes at 10 meter resolution, but we've, we've simulated at 30 meter for, for computational efficiency reasons. And we've, we've been able to incorporate all the river channels explicitly. So they all have a width and a depth that we can parameterize. We take the boundary conditions from this from a regional flood frequency analysis. So this is a standard index flood methodology, old school hydrology uh, technique. Um, but we've, we've constructed, taken the USGS gauge data and produced a regional frequency analysis, which tells us the magnitude of the, the one NT year return period flow anywhere on the continental US river network. We've got the levees in from the US Army National Levee data set, and we simulate a whole bunch of different return period events. So the first point of the presentation is that the data and the, the software tools now exist to build 2D models near automatically over very large areas. And then the question you, you then start to ask is, okay, so how good is, is that going to be? And we've been able to test it in a number of different ways. Um, we, can, we can look at uh, uh, undefended situations like this is Sacramento, 100 year flood event, assuming no flood defenses. And we put the flood defenses in, we, we get a, a, a much more uh, a correct simulation of the flood. So we've tested this in a number of ways. First way we tested it is to look at individual storm events where we've got really good data on um, uh, the areas that were inundated. Um, and so a very nice person at, the, at the, uh, the local newspaper in Houston gave us this data set for the 2015 uh, Memorial Day storm. And it's, the, uh, it's basically a, a Google map of properties that were flooded and, and, uh, in, during the event. So we've simulated this with our uh, uh, whole US model. And we can look at the number of properties that were correctly predicted being inundated that, that were identified by the Houston Chronicle. So green is good, red is, uh, red is with ones we said were uh, either uh, flooded and missed. So we capture we're getting close to 90% of the properties that, um, that uh, were observed as flooded in this data set. And in terms of validation for these kinds of data, that's not a, not a bad level of, uh, of success. So the event is somewhere, I mean, there are, there are problems with this type of validation in that the return period varies in space and exactly what the return period of the event was is, is somewhat arbitrary, but it's between a 100 and five year, 100 year event and if we simulate our thousand year flood, both pluvial and fluvial flooding simulated, we get this 90% capture rate. The 100 year layers capture around about 70% of the inundated properties. And we're somewhere in between the two. So not too bad on these individual storms. Ideally though, we would like to do some wide area validation. So one way we've done that is take all the uh, FEMA uh, one in 100 year flood maps and ingest those into Google Earth Engine. I think it's around about 2 million different shapefiles that we ingested. 
Now, that allows us to do a direct comparison between our, our prediction of the 100-year floodplain with FEMA's analysis. Um, so we take all those local studies developed by 1D HECRAS modeling, typically, or, or more uh, ad hoc methods, and we resample those to the resolution uh, model. Um, actually, this is 30 meters. Um, and we look at, at the unexamined areas of the FEMA data set. So the FEMA coverage is, is only the areas in red. There's around about 40% of the US that FEMA doesn't currently cover. And we also have a problem with the FEMA data is that, that when you look at it, it's clear that they've only really done the main rivers and, and not the headwater areas. But we'll, we'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how we, how we can work around those. So that's, that's the issue with the headwater areas in FEMA. This is, uh, in blue is the, the areas that are predicted as, as at, uh, the 100 year floodplain predicted by FEMA. The red is the 100 year floodplain in our model. And we can see some clearer areas where we're, we're over predicting relative to FEMA. But some other areas where we predict flooding along valley bottom, that, that it, it seems to us that FEMA hasn't modeled those. And there probably is really flooding risk in those locations, but it's not picked up in the FEMA data set. Therefore, as a metric for comparing um, FEMA and our model, we can only really use a hit rate um, as a, a sensible metric. False alarm rate or critical success index really don't make a lot of sense because of these, these unexamined uh, areas. If you, you zoom out a little bit further, you can see the, the scale of the problem. So some places we do really well, some places we do, we do less well. Um, we're plotting here hits in blue, false alarms in red. Uh, misses um, in black. Uh, and what we've tried to do firstly is buffer the FEMA flood map. So put a, a one kilometer buffer all the way around it and only calculate our, our fit metrics within that buffer. The, the approximate size of the buffer you need is going to be somewhat scale depend, dependent. It, it's a, a very arbitrary uh, way of doing it. And, and we're going to still get um, what we consider to be false alarms, or the metric considers to be false alarms, actually to be really flood risk correctly predicted by our model. So we're only going to really talk about the hit rate in these analyses. But if we do the comparison between the, mod, the, the continental model and the FEMA data set, we get a hit rate of 81% across the whole US. And that goes up um, in catchments that are above 80 square kilometers. The model, our model performs less well in, in catch, catchments below that threshold. And where we only look at, at where FEMA has what it designates as high quality data, that's typically data that's computed, flood maps computed with a HECRAS model, the hit rate goes up to 86%. Yeah, this is not too bad because FEMA data is not truth. And where we do a comparison of a, any sort of bespoke 2D model to say satellite inundation data, hit rates of, of 90% or above are about as good as you ever, ever really get. So we're approaching the skill of of uh, bespoke 2D modeling, but not probably not quite there. Critical success index, if you want to calculate it, is 59%, but probably undervalues the, the model skill a little bit that is there for computing. And we also see that the, the, uh, the continental model does less well in arid areas, and that's because the, the return period flows are, are, are not so well constrained in the regions above frequency analysis. So the performance is much better in temperate areas and drops off in continental and, and arid areas as well. Probably exactly as you would expect. The other way we've validated the, the continental model is to look at a number of locations where the USGS has built bespoke 1 and 2D models. So these are probably built to a higher standard than, than, than FEMA studies. They probably had a bit more care and attention uh, lavished on them. So we'd expect them to be really uh, a bit closer to the truth than FEMA data. 10 of these sites with 100 year simulations, and there's a three further sites where they've got simulations of different return periods as well. And if we have a look at these, this is the, the hit rates. That, the hit rates here now get a bit higher. The average is, is about 92%. You know, Albany, you know, uh, it looks really good. Um, so some places we do less well, but it's still a coherent match. Some places the hit rate is excellent, but there, there's, there's potential false alarms in here in, in red. And we can go through looking at all of these. So where we look against the USGS model, we do a pretty good job here. Uh, and when we look at different return periods, it's the same story. So this is Battle Creek, Michigan, one in 500 year event, 
a really nice hill race. You can see it's a big flood in a confined valley. It's probably quite easy to, easy to predict. Probably lots of different methods would do this quite well. You'd hope the, the continental model would do okay, and, and it does. Um, again, smaller flood, but again in a confined valley. Um, and this is more extensive, but we're still doing pretty, uh, pretty uh, well. On the whole, it tends to be easier to predict big, bigger events, which are valley filling, if you're using inundation extensive metrics. But um, it's, the, it's the thing that we can do over a wide area, so that's pretty good. So the conclusion from that part is that the model seems to be working pretty well. And it, and it gives us some faith that we can use it to make inferences about flood risk across the entire US. So now if I can weave, you know, that, that's, a bit, that's a bit like David's talk. And now if I can weave in a bit that, that, that somewhat takes the themes of Susan's talk and bring, bring the session together. We're now going to do some risk calculations, bringing together the, the hazard maps with exposure and vulnerability of the disease. So the vote exposure that we can get across the whole US are things like value of buildings within the floodplain, number of people within the floodplain. Um, I'm going to have to talk to Susan afterwards and intersect some of our data layers with the social vulnerability. And I think that could be a really neat story in there too. And then, you know, the, the risk is hazard times exposure times vulnerability. And the vul vulnerability, we have to have some function to relate the hazard to the potential damages. And typically what we'd use in flooding is a depth damage curve. So I'll just walk you through what, what we do. So we take our 30 meter resolution flood hazard model of the continental US. And then we take the, the population data, we take the Environmental Protection Agency's uh, decimetric um, population data. So this is decimetrically downscaled census data to 30 meter resolution. So it takes the 2010 census and assigns it to 30 meter pixels based on things like land use and slope. We take FEMA's National Structure Inventory, which gives us the location of, of 114 million different structures within, within the US floodplain. It tells us something about their location, their value, their type, and their number of stories, and their, 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 their general characteristics. And we can use those to, to decide um, what kind of vulnerability function we should be using. We take the National Land Use Database, uh, which indicates developed areas. Um, and then we do some future projections of socioeconomic change because EPA have very, very cleverly done this project called ECLUS, Integrated Climate and Land Use Scenarios, which give projections of population and land use change out to 2100 under different shared socioeconomic pathway scenarios, principally SSP2, which tracks US census projections, and SSP5, which is a high growth scenario. And then the vulnerability functions we take from Corps of Engineers standard uh, relationships between water depth and percentage damage structure. We've got a whole bunch of those for different structure types, which we can relate to the infrastructure inventory. But we don't have that data, you know, the, the FEMA NSI data for the future. So for the future projections, we just use one generalized curve. So what does that, what does that tell us? Well, when we look at present day risk in the US, if we look at our, our data and we intersect our one in 100, uh, 50, 500 year hazard layers with the population data set, the one in 100 year event, we, we suggest that there's around about 41 million Americans living within the 100 year floodplain. So that's around about 13% of total US population in 2010. If we do the same analysis with the, the FEMA data layer, we only get a value of 13 million. That's partly because it's 40% of the country that's not covered. But also, there's a lot of risk residing in those headwater areas that, that are not included in the FEMA maps. If we take a, uh, another global flood risk data product, the, the aqueduct flood risk uh, maps, um, again, the in, we intersect those with the, the population data set. We only get a, an exposure of about 15, 16 million. Again, that's because they only consider the, the, the larger catchment, so nothing uh, below about sort of five to 10,000 square kilometers. That's present day, um, uh, uh, and there's, there's a big discrepancy here. So what we're suggesting from this analysis, you know, we, you know, it might not be 41 million, it might be you know, plus or minus five on that, but even given the errors, there's a significant difference between what you would identify as the population risk in the FEMA data what we would with this, this new continental scale model. 
Then if we look at the, the future exposures, by 2050, just taking the business as usual SSP2 pathway, the exposure has gone up to 61 million in the 100 year event. And actually the, the proportion of the US population that's exposed has gone up from about 13 to 15 and a half. So that's 24, 20 million up, 2.3 percentage points more US total population in, in the 100 year flood plan. And then same story if you go out to 2100, now the number is 74.8. So that's 34 million up on present day and um, 3.1 percentage points uh, in terms of the proportion of the US population. If you look at the, the value of those assets in the floodplain, if you look at just the, the total value of the exposed assets in the 100 year floodplain from present day, it's about 5.5 trillion US dollars. And if those assets were to get hit based on the, the depth damage curves that we have, the, po the potential damage would be about 1.2 trillion US. So the 100 year developed floodplain in the US is currently about the, approximately the land area of Georgia. If we take that forward using these ECOWAS scenarios, then in uh, uh, 2050, the exposed assets go up to 8.1 trillion, uh, the potential damage up to 1.7, uh, and the, the, the 100 year developed floodplain is, is currently, is then approximately the area of South Dakota. By 2100, we're up to the size of Kansas, 9.1, 9.8 trillion of assets, um, potentially in harm's way. So the difference, you know, the 100 year newly developed floodplain is approximately the land area of West Virginia. So even not in, taking into account potential climate change, which is, which is uh, very likely to change the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the intensity and duration of extreme flooding, both fluvial and alluvial, we just look at socioeconomic change alone, a lot of which we're already locked into because of uh, trends in population growth. Flood risk in the US is, is very likely to rise in the future, and, and the proportion of the US population exposed to flooding is also likely to rise. So, to conclude the presentation, we developed a whole US model uh, which seems to have a reasonable skill at predicting inundation. And it's not quite there, but it's approaching the skill that we get when we build local bespoke models. Um, and to compare those against observations of, of flooding from satellites and air photo. We intersect those, those uh, simulations with high resolution population data. We show that the exposed population in the US to flooding is about three times high, higher than, than you previously estimated using the FEMA information. Socioeconomic change alone is going to increase the proportion of the US population exposed to flooding during the 21st century. Uh, and, and climate change will undoubtedly amplify those effects even further, even if we find it difficult to say exactly where, when, and by how much climate change will, will affect flood risk. We think it probably will based on you know, simple, simple atmospheric physics like the classics claypool relationship. And lastly, the one problem with all these hazard maps is that they, they present an unrealistic view of flood events, both, uh, both the FEMA flood map and our flood map are essentially constant for term period in space. So we're looking at, 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 at things that actually don't look like real flood. And that, I think the next thing that we have to do here is, is to produce some way of stochastically simulating uh, uh, things that look like real flood event footprints where the return period varies in space. And that's what we're working on. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Any questions? Do you consider that they have levees, they have a drainage, you know, structures, they have all kinds of detention basins in the cities or when you do the flood mapping? Yeah, so we put the structures in from the US National Levee Database, but that's a really incomplete source. But anecdotally, we've, we've been told people think it's only about 30% of the, the levees known to exist and they're already in the database. The problem when you're building a continental model is you, is you can't go hunting for local data everywhere. You, you have to use data set, the data that's there in national databases. Um, so that's one 
constraints. So the levees are in there to the extent that the national databases contain them. But we know that's very incomplete. What we're working on at the moment is, is uh, a series of analyses which, which try to predict the likelihood that, uh, that a given pixel in the model is, is defended by um, a levee or some other structure. So we're trying to give probabilities to the probability there's a levee there, the, the probability that it's standard of protection and the probability that it might fail. So you can imagine some kind of fault tree decision tree that comes out with a, a probability that a, that a given pixel is defended by a levee, uh, depending on its location, its land use, um, and, and, other, and possibly even socioeconomic area. That seems to work reasonably well to first order to fill in the gaps where the, the national databases break down. But again, it's not perfect. Um, I, I wanted to ask a quick question. Like, I think you answered one of my questions in the last one was why we are choosing that 100 years because one of the sites you chose was Indiana and Indiana had 200 year floods in one year. It so, can happen. Yeah, it can happen. And the other question is, have you taken into consideration the fact that a lot of the floods in the future and even today are not next to a floodplain? There are flash floods, they're happening without any proximity to water body at all. Uh, yeah, so the models, I, I wasn't clear about this. So we simulate both fluvial and pluvial flooding. So for the pluvial, uh, for the fluvial we take um, a regional flood frequency analysis on gauge discharge data, and we use that to work out extreme uh, river flow, uh, uh, extreme river discharge. We do the same regional frequency analysis for rainfall using National Weather Service uh, rainfall data, and then we do a rain on grid approach. Um, and that allows us to simulate um, uh, flooding generated by intense rainfall down to catchments of a few kilometers square. Um, I, there is a slight thing, of, of, certainly in the insurance industry, they, they tend to think of a lot of uh, flood losses as being off floodplain because they, they have a, a really limited conception of what the river network is. Um, they don't only, only consider main rivers as part of the- um, They're looking at urban drainage as well. Because yeah. I think this model, at least like, if you look at it conceptually, it almost looks like you're not taking no, uh, what, yes, we are, but not very well. Um, so we make an allowance for an assumed capacity of the sewer network. So we assume that the sewer network can handle the, the one in T year return period rainfall, and we, it's an excess rainfall of that. So that's not a, uh, uh, a very detailed way of doing it, but it's taking it into account. But again, I go back to the point that if you're going to build a national model in an automated framework, you can only use data sets that, that are exist and are and available. Um, but I think a lot of what the insurance industry thinks of as off floodplain flooding is, is actually really connected to the river. It's just in headwater basins. Hello. Hello. My name is Terry Idle. I'm with the Open Geospatial Consortium. We had a chance to talk earlier. My question actually is for you and would have been for Susan also, is as you output this really rich data in these maps, do you have any standards or anything that you output them in so people can ingest the information behind it into other sources and be able to use the information behind the maps? I guess we're using Earth Engine um, just because uh, using Google service to crunch some of these numbers really takes the sting out of things. So insofar as, as that's a standard format, then that's what we're using. Um, otherwise, we tend to use either ASCII rasters or, or binaries just to compress the file size. So not, not very much, is, I guess, is the answer. Um, two, I guess I have two questions. Um, the first is, have you compared your model to the national water model that, uh, that NOAA is running down in Tuscaloosa? That's the first question. And the second is, it seems that for, for your work and the work of the other speakers, there's two ways to use the model. One is for uh, immediate first responders, say there's going to be a storm of a certain magnitude and a certain inundation. And the second is for long-term planning um, to, to you know, protect infrastructure. And I'm wondering how you see these models or your models specifically being used. Okay, yeah. Um, so the first question is, um, we haven't compared to the national water model, but we have compared uh, in, uh, for a flood event south of Paris, we compared the hand uh, inundation mapping methodology to 
our inundation modelling for that region. Um, and there was a paper on that at the European Geophysical Union um, a couple of months ago. Um, we did that in collaboration with a, a French insurance company. Um, and so there's some interesting conclusions there about which method works best. Uh, the hand method works well, it, it seems to me, in confined river channels uh, or, or confined valleys. I think it starts to become more problematic when uh, the flow, the, the particular flow pathway becomes more complex. So in, in wide plains, um, then real hydrodynamics and mass conservation is going to, to, going to should win the day most of the time. Um, so your second question was about how these data are used. At the moment, these are set up for the, the second of your application planning purpose. So we, we give these data to, uh, or the, these data are used by people in the insurance industry for deciding on um, reinsurance contracts and, and pricing. You could use it for zoning planning uh, decisions. You could use it for forward planning and you know, working out how much the US should be investing every year in flood defenses to mitigate the risks what I'd like to see in the future is, is you, we would hook up these hydraulic models to either um, numerical weather prediction or, or climate change uh, models and, and land use models. And we drive them with output from those. In fact, with GI, we're, we're currently linking versions of the list flood model to the, the VIC land use model. Um, but I can see once you can do it for VIC, you can pretty much do it for, for anything. Um, and I'd really like to see that develop over the next three to five years as well. I think it'd be really powerful and be really interesting. Let's thank Paul one more time.